All right, guys, today on the show, very stoked to be joined by a composer, horror film composer. Uh, his newest work, Dreamcatcher, is out right now. You can see it right now. Just came out the other day. Also stoked to know that he is the composer for a uh, friend of ours, Mark Patton's Scream Queen documentary. Um, we welcome film composer Alexander Taylor to the show. How are you doing, Matt? Fine, man. Yeah, thanks again for having me. This is awesome. Uh, yeah, we are happy to have you. We, um, you know, like I said in the introduction, I haven't had a chance to check out Dreamcatcher yet. We were yeah, busy actually working on a film project of, of our own this past weekend. Oh, nice. Um, when it, when Jordan sent me the email that it was, it was dropping, I'm like, absolutely. I want to talk to him, but I just didn't know if I was going to get a chance to check it out, but I did check out the trailer cool. and it you know, the aesthetic is very cool. It takes place over the course of like a music festival type scene. Yes. And uh, the killer looks pretty rad. Uh, the, the art on the poster looks really rad too, where he has like that, like a, a, a French uh, plague, bubonic plague type style mask. It looks like with a bunch of like scratches and stuff on it. Yeah, so, it, was, it was actually made to look more like uh, an owl. I was getting the bubonic plague sort of feeling as well. Um, yeah. But uh, it's actually designed, I can't remember the, the artist's name, but uh, he designed like the Groot costume as well. Oh. as He did several like Iron Man masks and suits. Wow. So I think you can okay. see that like actually in like a similar style. And uh, Yeah, now that you say that, yeah. Yeah, I didn't know that. When I learned that, I was like, oh, I didn't even notice that until, you know, later i can you can see the little parallels but right actually all the scratches um i i also learned that those are uh, that's actually supposed to be a dream catcher and it kind of centers around his eye interesting okay yeah it's pretty cool man um yeah i think it was jj's idea uh jacob jacob johnson that's the director um you know he was kind of taking cues from like uh like dead mal or uh uh who are those the the two Daft Punk. Daft Punk, thank you. Yeah, like, yeah. Uh, like EDM artists or, um, you know, musicians like that, that kind of like wear the mask. Right. And that's kind of where he got the idea from. So like the central character, he's a DJ named Dreamcatcher. And yeah, I got that's you. Kind of, that's, his, that's his thing. Got it. Yeah. yeah, that's good. I mean, I've never seen a horror movie in this vein take place uh, in this environment. So I'm, I'm stoked to check it out. If whenever there's something that uh, comes along that hasn't been done to death. And it seems like the horror genre is definitely the genre that produces more films like that, mm -hmm. where there's the original take on a concept that people love. Um, I'm stoked to check it out. Like you don't have to, you don't have to do a whole lot to get me excited for a good, for a fun horror movie. And whenever you get like a concept like uh, that, now that you say that, like the whole dream catcher in the mask, I mean, that right there tells me that the, you know, the guy behind it, uh, the director and then the costume designer, um, seemingly the composer, you know, they all put a whole lot of thought than just trying to throw something together. Yeah, there's it, a ton of attention know. to detail in this film. And it's it's something that like I've, even as I was like working on it, because as you're composing, you kind of watch the scenes over and over and over. I didn't really pick up on it until like I saw the final cut, you know, when you can finally separate yourself from like a professional as just like a fan watching it. Mm -hmm. Credit to like JJ and like the rest of the team for like paying attention and like putting these little details in there that just kind of make make a good movie. You know, it was just it was a blast to be on. I'm very lucky. The thing with composing something like this in this environment what was that like because i would imagine that the score of this one still has to have like horror elements to it and then doing that with you know the background of it it's an edm festival what was that like that was actually a ton of fun for me um because as you know probably in horror like a lot of the uh the soundscapes or the palettes are they're kind of similar it's a lot like of orchestral stuff a lot of you know strings french horn um and of course, there's the whole like 80s throwback thing that's been very popular nowadays. Um, we did not do that with this film. A lot of people, I think, just assume because whenever 
you do an electronic score, especially since Stranger Things, people just kind of assume like, oh, it's like an 80s throwback or, oh, it's like very Carpenter influenced. Mm -hmm. um, this was cool, though, because like I got to go back to like my sort of like uh, I've been saying this a lot, like my rock roots. Uh, I started off yeah. guitar, as you can see, I've got a bunch. That was like my primary instrument. I wanted to be like a rock star. And then I just kind of found my way into film scoring. Um, yeah. So I got to bring back uh, an electric guitar into like as one of the main voices for the score, which was a blast because like, you know, like I said, that doesn't happen often. Yeah, so I tried to mimic. Um, I'm sure you know Aerosmith. Uh, oh, yeah. Dream On. Um, just because Dreamcatcher, Dream On, I guess that's just kind of where my brain went. Plus, I just love his guitar tone in that particular track. Mm -hmm. So I tried kind of mimicking that with my guitar. But then, like, I ended up going way off the rails and, like, throwing a bunch of reverb and, like, making it kind of, like, haunting but still kind of jangly. And that was fun. Um, but the score itself also... Uh, I, I wasn't hired to do EDM music. We actually, they were smart enough to bring in like actual EDM artists because I am certainly not an expert. <laughs> I had to like learn a lot about EDM. So like I kind of got schooled by, uh, Jacob kind of gave me a rundown and uh, my older sister, Amanda, she's like an elder goth kind of in like the, the club scene. So she kind of um, taught me a lot about like uh, just a quick crash course. Mm -hmm. And I pulled in some elements because naturally I kind of, I wanted to reflect the environment because it takes place at this like EDM concert. So there are EDM elements, but it's definitely not an EDM score. It just has sort of that electronic feel. Uh, that was a ton of fun, man. With doing that, did you get to collaborate with the EDM artists that they did bring involved? I did not, unfortunately. There's a, there's one track in particular. I can't remember for the life of me who did it. It happens like closer to the end it's like there's this female vocalist mm -hmm. i think they might have actually written that particular track for the film i'm not sure i can't don't quote me on that mm -hmm. but uh i wish i was involved um because those guys and gals they are incredibly talented people in that particular genre and i learned a lot you know just from watching what they what they, what they did what so what was the the turning point for you 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 said that you were, you were trying to to kind of the, the band scene, what was it that brought you into the film scene? Well, it's weird. Like when I was growing up, I always knew I wanted to be an entertainer in some way or form. Um, so like when I was a kid, I wanted to be an actor. And then like I saw my cousin playing guitar one time when I was probably, I think, nine or 10. And I was like, oh, mm -hmm. now I want to do that. So I started playing guitar um, and I just kind of did that all throughout high school. And I was in a bunch of bands. Um, more kind of like blues rock sort of funk garage rock like kind of like the strokes or the hives or the vines i was really mm -hmm. into that like anything with the in the title i was really into like uh, jack white the white stripes essentially he taught me how to play guitar um but uh you know i did that all throughout high school and then into college uh, i actually went into uh i studied motion picture production mm. at Wright state yeah this really cool it's like a awesome little college in um ohio in dayton and it doesn't really i feel like it, it has it it is well respected actually tom hanks is like a huge fan of it now huh <laughs> he has been for a while like he's donated like a lot to like the school he brings a lot of attention to it um because they churn out some like incredible filmmakers um uh but so i studied directing there um and as i was in film school uh we you know, couldn't really afford to hire composers because our budgets were like shoestring budgets. It was like right. two, two to eight grand maybe for like a, a short film. So like out of practicality, uh, I just kind of did my own scores. Uh, and I did all the other film projects for the grade above and below. And and I, I did probably about like 14 to 20 scores before I even like moved out to L.A., not mm. knowing that like that's really invaluable because i know like a lot of people who actually study film uh composition they don't really even have a chance to to score that many throughout their time learning how to do this craft and i just kind of like learned it on the spot like i said out of necessity um and i never thought for the life of me i never thought you could make a living off of it because it was my favorite part it was my favorite part of making films um fast forward to now and that's that's all I, that's all I do. That's, that's <laughs> and I love it, man. I love it. Yeah. That's awesome. The, you know, the, uh, 
film when I was told that you worked on Scream Queen. Oh, yeah. That is a, I mean, that documentary, I interviewed Mark. I love Mark. And um, he was there with Lisa at a convention that we, we do the production for. And the room, it was, it's actually kind of an even deep, crazier story than that because the guy who was supposed to do the interview um, kind of broke into uh, panel production at the same time. And at the time, who was then our boss, like got us in to, to do this. And then he, he quit right after and he left me with this, you know, panel production thing for what is a, a major con here in Northern California. And uh, so fast forward and the guy who was supposed to interview Mark and Lisa had broken in at the same time. Well, he calls me like 4 a.m. day of, and he's like, I can't come like a family emergency. So I'm like, oh shit. So I'm watching Nightmare on Elm Street 2 at like, six o'clock in the morning the and, best time. The best and, time. Yeah. <laughs> and the whole time you know and mark would back this up later but i'm like this movie is fucking like it is shot weird like this is like this seems there's something else going on with this movie is all is all i was thinking and he mark and i were laughing later that day about the whole bedroom scene and him dancing. And I was kind of like, what the fuck is going on? Like, what is this? Like, this is Nightmare on Elm Street. And I mean, but then like, you know, later on the, the freaking scene where Freddie cuts himself out of him. I mean, that's like one of the most iconic nightmare scenes of all time. So to each their own. Um, but I go and I introduce myself to them the morning of the convention. And he's very standoffish at first. Oh, because Mark. because he had met in the guy who was supposed to interview him the day before and they'd gotten familiar and everything. And so he was he was like, Well, what what happened? And I'm like, Well, this is you know the situation. Um and I was kind of explaining to him, like, hey, it's just me, like I'm getting ready to do eight of these in a row. Like you guys are at this time, like I appreciate you very much, like blah, blah, blah. Um, if you have any questions, you can find this person and he uh he's like okay okay and then we got out there and we did the panel and i asked him about you know the movie and he he proceeds to just like open up and tell the whole story of scream queen and then he says i'm about to start production on this documentary and you know lo and behold you know six months later where he's posting you know the first concept poster and everything for this documentary and that documentary man is like that is a heavy hitting documentary i love it that was that's easily going to be one of my i mean it's one of my favorite projects i've ever been on and i i, I i've said this uh but i haven't said it to like mark or uh you know roman or tyler the directors but i know they know this if if, if i ever get uh, i i will be able to trace all of my success back to that documentary it's opened up so many doors for me and just the project itself it meant so much and working with them I, it's a life-changing experience and as you know you got to work with mark like you got yeah. to talk with him he's so like open he's so open and so giving about anything like advice knowledge jokes story he's like a he's an entertainer and like a very he's just like a beautiful human i just i love that guy and i loved working on that documentary like that was that's it's so good it's oh that was a dream <laughs> with that when you're sitting there and you're composing the movies i'm i'm assuming your first watch has you know no music at all because you're composing it so what is that because that's like one of the things that you really come to appreciate in a horror movie but you really come to appreciate as a student of film mm -hmm. is how much music adds to any situation there's been films um that i have done 
through film school where I had thought I had put in too much music as just background. And you have the, you know, the, the review from the professor would be like, no more, like you need more music, like put more um, in there. And it's one of those things that you can clearly, you know, if, if a performance is just like staggering by an actor or an actress, it's something that kind of like slips away almost mm -hmm. and becomes a complimentary thing depending on the scene. But it's something that the second that it's gone, uh, music is one of the first things that I notice is missing to any film, not just horror film. But what is that like to sit down for you? What is like your creative process like just for, you know, take uh, the latest the latest film, uh, Dreamcatcher, um, for an example. But what is your creative process like, man? Like do you, you sit there and you watch – the whole thing with no music do you like do certain scenes at a time what do you what do you like to do it's uh it kind of depends it, it changes from project to project um some directors uh rely heavily on temp music uh which sometimes can be problematic a lot of uh composers don't like temp i i like temp especially like within the first cut as long as the directors don't fall in love with the temp and basically ask you to plagiarize i'm lucky i've never had that problem um but there are times where like, you know, the reason why I like having temp in there is because you kind of know what world sonically that the filmmaker wants to live in. Is this mm. Hispanic? Is this electronic? Is this hybrid? Is this jazz? Like, does, do they like drums? Do they like this? You know, you get an idea and that, that helps me. Mm -hmm. um, I want to get in there as early as possible, though, so they don't fall in love with their temp music. Uh, uh, with, with Jacob, um, they had uh some temp music in there but the cool thing was i started working with jacob probably still when he was at the the screen of uh, script stage so mm -hmm. before they even shot the film he and i were just kind of spitballing ideas about like hey what do we like what type of music are we feeling here like you know so we would like send tracks back and forth so we both kind of came up with um the general idea of what would go in there um he, yeah. uh, he had more of a clear idea before obviously because it was his this whole project was his idea um so by the time we got to you know the the edit there were only a few scenes that had temp music and i kind of knew i mean i already knew what it was so he kind of let me a lot of it was just i got to do what i wanted which was like that is a that's a dream it was uh, like that for Dreamcatcher and for Scream Queen. There was no temp music in Scream Queen, which was wow. Awesome. Um, it, it, it involves a lot of trust between you and the director. Um, I've had other films, though, other shorts, um, where there's temp music and they just want you to hit like every single beat, which is fine. That's totally fine as long as, again, as long as they're not asking me to plagiarize. Yeah. Um, but uh, for Dreamcatcher, I got a full cut. Um, it was locked, which is good that doesn't always happen because it's always a kind of a nightmare when you're going through like writing music and they'll edit something or they'll change something because it throws off your entire timeline for the music. yeah so you'll have to change so any any edit that comes in uh you'll have to fix the music for um so yeah that's kind of what that process was like <laughs> yeah <laughs> that um when you say that when you get a uh, project and it's in picture lock like that. So, you know, they're not going to change it. Yeah. How often does that happen? Uh, I'd say uh, like negative five out of 10. <laughs> <laughs> I think that may have been my first project that is, that was locked. Scream Queen. Uh, this was my fault. I love, again, I love Ty Roman. I love Tyler. I love Mark. I love that project. I started too early and that was my fault. Roman and Tyler, they wanted me to wait a little bit mm -hmm. uh, to to start writing music. I started writing music for that, like probably like 30 cuts away from what would have been the final cut. So I have like hours and hours of music that like I didn't even like end up using. Like a lot of it hit. The oh, cutting. wow. Which is like, again, that's my fault. It was because I was I was really hungry. I really wanted to write. Um, I really liked the project. I love Roman and Tyler. So I, I used that as an excuse to make them talk to me. <laughs> um, and uh, that that's, yeah. Because I know a, a few interviews that I've had, they're like, how come it took you two or three years to write that score? And I have to like say like, no, it wasn't like 
it doesn't take me that long to write. It's just like there were so many cuts and I have to adjust the music per cut. So it's interesting seeing like listening to that particular soundtrack for Scream Queen because it kind of plays like a, almost like a like a like a diary over like three years of my life. I can kind of remember like what happened when I, that day when I was writing that cue and mm-hmm. you know, what I was doing then because like there are all these cues over three years they just bring back memories almost kind of like you smell something and it brings you back to a memory. That's how it is with music for me. Like I'll hear something. It brings me right back to a moment. Yeah. I I would say that, you know, sound and smell are two things that definitely will do that to the majority of us. A sound, a song, a, a score, um, I mean, I can tell you for me personally, it would be like a theme park music. Like that instantly, that's a ton of memories of like childhood vacations. Oh, yeah. Um, so yeah, music is very powerful that way. So for sure, I can feel that. What, what, uh, what, because your, your filmography is, uh, pretty much predominantly as far as like the major releases that have gotten out there for like the masses to be able to see are, horror films that you have worked on. I'm curious, what, you know, are you a lifelong fan of, of scary movies? Oh yeah. Uh, I've been a fan of horror since I was a child. Uh, one of my first costumes, I don't know how I saw Halloween, but by the time I was seven years old, I was Michael Myers for Halloween. Hmm. Um, I probably saw an edited for TV version. I don't want to throw my parents under the bus, but I watched a lot of scary movies growing up, probably too young. And I guess I turned out okay. (laughs) Um, But uh, the thing with uh, working in this industry um, as a music composer or like as an actor or as a director in entertainment, you can get like pigeonholed um, and do a lot of things. Mm -hmm. And I kind of figured like, well, if I'm going to get pigeonholed, I'm going to choose horror. Like I'm going to like push that. Like I want to, I, I love horror. And I think it's the genre as a composer, at least for me personally, that gives you the most uh, freedom to experiment. You have a very long leash and the directors, they're cool with you coming up with like fresh and interesting ideas. So that's why I do pursue horror. That's why if you go to my website, it's like Alex Taylor, horror guy, horror composer. I want people to think of when they're like, man, we need to get a composer for that. We need, we need music for this movie. I want them, somebody to think like, oh, Alex, Alexander Taylor, like that's the guy I want. Cause like, I don't know, I would like my name to be synonymous with it. Uh, and I'm working on it. I'm working on it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's really cool, man. Um, the, the uh, thing too, that I think a lot of people always associate horror music uh, with is John Carpenter and the Halloween franchise. So you, you know, started off with a, a strong uh, taste with Michael Myers there at the young age because Carpenter, obviously, you know, if you, if you follow him outside of film, he's got like two albums. Now he tours, he does concerts, three albums. Wow. I'm a huge fan. I'm a huge fan of John Carpenter. Um, I love him. I love his work. One of my favorite movies, um, uh in the mouth of madness i think it's incredibly underrated i see you have a fog poster i love the fog yeah harvard is my favorite filmmaker uh and he was very influential on my music uh like he is for everyone he practically invented synthwave i think i think a lot of people credit him for that and rightfully so um yeah man he's just great like him and alan howarth what they did for all of his early movies God, he's so, it's so catchy. He's so catchy. It's amazing. That was one thing because Rob Zombie's Halloween gets shit on a lot. But that one thing that I thought, I personally, I, I thought he did a decent job. But the one thing that I thought he did uh, really good decision making was taking that original score and just kind of transplanting it. And when the movie hit, you know, the second and third act, and it basically becomes a, a shot for shot homage to the original like he's using that original music to go with his michael myers i don't know that whole we're watching rob zombie but we're listening to carpenter's music was pretty was pretty dope yeah i think that was uh tyler bates i think was the composer for that i think um he's an incredibly talented guy too and yeah his rendition is awesome what i think is interesting about that particular uh 
franchise in the sequel mm -hmm. not in it it's like they actually like i think they went out of their way to make sure that the, the halloween theme wasn't in it there were certain scenes where i remember like oh it could totally be there but i think i think rob wanted to make it his own i'm not a huge fan of rob zombie's take i love rob zombie like kudos like to him and like what he's doing i love the mask redesign i know that yeah it was wayne toth that guy i actually got to work for him for a second he was he's great um but that mask looked dope that's one of the things that i i thought was great about uh rob zombie's take what did you think of the 18 version love it oh dude okay that um i actually just got not an argument but like a little debate <laughs> Hollow Weekly um, about um, I, someone was like shitting on the movie. I love Halloween 2018. I also love every timeline of Halloween. I love H2O. I mm. love, you know, four, five, and six. I loved Halloween three. I love it. Um, but Halloween 2018, I think is so interesting. The mask redesign, Chris Nelson, I, that's the most, that's the best looking mask since the original, personally. I think they did such a great job. It looks just like the original, yeah. Yeah, and like just like how withered it was, and was just like, and I know he was scared. I got to, I met him once at a a, a bar in uh, Toluca Lake, and he was going mm -hmm. on about how like he was actually kind of nervous about because um, you know like if if you join on like a, a big franchise, like a popular franchise, there's gonna pe be people that love it, and there's gonna be a lot of assholes that are just gonna like hate on it. He For got, sure, I think most people, even the people who didn't like the movie, loved the look of the mask. I think so. Oh yeah, I I don't at all the complaints I have come across about that film, and that film is very decisive. I mean, you talk about uh, decisive films. I think we're on the cusp of one with uh, the Snyder Cut coming out in a couple of days, and uh, Halloween twenty eighteen is right up there with that as far as the decisiveness of that of the franchise and the fans of it with that movie. But none of the complaints uh, have ever been about how Michael looked. Or the music, the music. Or the music, awesome. yeah. Awesome. That's one of my favorite cues in the entire franchise is in that movie, The Shape Hunts Allison. I don't know if you remember, it's like so catchy. It's like, da na 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 It's like, it's just, it's so good. And it's original to that movie. It, that cue had never been done in the past. I think it happens right after, yeah, it happens right after, um, I forgot the actress's name, even the, the main character, but when a friend gets impaled. Oh, yeah, I know what you're talking about just kind of looms around the corner and then uh i think daniel davies he's the, the guitarist takes a bow kind of like uh, jimmy page and just kind of bows across the guitar it's like it's like this deep <laughs> like awesome like i love those it was da daniel davies cody carpenter and john carpenter they're awesome i love i love their work uh, that's why i'm really pumped about the new one because i know they're just going to be even more inventive on this next one i'm really excited for that the thing that's interesting with this is the fact that they you know tried to pretty much play to the to the fact that you know four, five, and six never existed. Mm -hmm. And I personally I really like Danielle Harris's whole angle mm -hmm. in that whole story. And I like you mentioned Halloween three, I will always have love for Halloween three just because it's Halloween three. It's the oddball of the franchise. Like, but how can you not enjoy um I mean again, the fog, Tom Atkins. Yep. Oh, uh, yeah. But, yeah. <laughs> but uh Halloween eighteen, the one thing that it really lost me on mm -hmm. uh was when they had the doctor put the mask on. Like that whole scene. I was like, "What? Okay, what are we doing?" Like, Doctor Sartain, I think. No, I agree. I remember the first time I saw that scene. It's grown on me since, but the first time I was like, "No, don't do that." But then I kind of realized what they were trying to do, and I, I'm appreciating it more now. The, the movie's certainly not flawless. It's very yeah. hard to find a flawless movie, but they wanted to introduce someone who is basically the exact opposite of Doctor Loomis. Who? Yeah. Doctor Loomis is my favorite character in horror history. Donald Pleasance is. It's, he's pretty he's, iconic he's irreplaceable and i know they try they, and they i think they knew that so they introduced like a doctor and i think even laurie says like oh you're the new loomis and that line made me chuckle um but uh i appreciate it i i it took i hated it at first i'll be honest i did not like that storyline but it's grown on me since and it kind of depends on how the next two movies go right not, like that kind of like soaks into my right. Of, but I also do love the 
Daniel Harris storyline, the Jamie storyline is incredible. The, you know, the, the genre in itself, I mean, we've seen already here this year, um, you know, anything coming from pretty soon, you have a new Conjuring movie all the way to, you know, something like Willie's Wonderland that came out uh, about a month ago now. As a fan, is there any uh, scary movie you're looking forward to checking out this year? Oh, man. Yeah, there's a ton. I'm excited for uh, Nia DaCosta or Nia. I can't remember how to say it. Uh, her remake of uh, Candyman. I think that'll be really Oh, cool. yeah. That's going to be yeah. really fucking cool. Um, it's, she, it's got a, she's got a lot. She's got to kind of, you know, stand up to essentially because like the original is so iconic. But I have a feeling between like her and Peel, like in that whole like the monkey paw team, um, they're going to kill it. Mm -hmm. uh, excited for the new Scream as well. It'll be different without Wes, obviously, because, you know, Wes was kind of like the heart of that franchise. He's one for of sure. Um, but I'm a, I'm a huge Scream fanboy. Too. I even like the third one. I know most people shit on that one. Um, I, I typically find things to enjoy about everything, <laughs> every horror movie. I like Scream 3 in the sense that it showed you the behind the scenes of film production and the fact that Absolutely. they're going through the sound stages and all that stuff. That was fun. Dude, I geeked out about that because I'm from Ohio originally. So, like, I, I I love anything that had to do with Hollywood. It still excites me. I mean, that's why I moved out here. Yeah. I, just, I, I think it's just it's cool to be around. So, like, that and that awe has never left me, by the way. I'm still starstruck. I still look around like a tourist. I think I'm always going to be a tourist in LA. I'm going to be completely honest. But uh, what else is coming out? Uh, I haven't seen Willy's Wonderland yet. Um, I'm excited to watch that. I've listened to the score. Uh, Emma is awesome. He's really cool. We're actually signed with the same agent, <laughs> um, uh, Peter Hackman. Um, his work is awesome. So I have to see it. I've just been, I've actually kept been busy since it came out. There's been a lot going on. The push for Dreamcatcher. I've been finishing up a few other movies. Man, what else is coming out this year? I think the big one, I mean, the, the heavy hitter one, I mean, that HBO WB deal that oh. was like, what a, what a, what a play by HBO to, to get that thing done. So um, <laughs> which is wild to think. I mean, the best, the best quote I can, I can have pulled up still is Christopher Nolan saying, I went to bed think, working for the greatest, uh, production studio that I could work for. And I woke up working for like the third best streaming service like that. Yeah. That is, that is a situation that <clears throat> I'm, pr I'm praying hands and knees that our movie theater can open before Godzilla and Kong comes, you know, here in another, another couple weeks. And I know, um, I get both sides of the argument, but I do definitely lean towards the people that made those movies with the intent that they were going to get to release them in the theater. Absolutely. Like that, that is a, that is a huge um, step down when you think about, you know, you're thinking that you're going to get to release these, albeit you've already delayed a lot of them. So yeah. they're, they're already bummed out in that regard, but now you're being told like, not only is it delayed, but it turns out, we're just going to, you know, go straight to streaming with it. Like, that's a bummer, man. That, and that happened to me this year. Like, I had, uh, this was supposed to be, like, a pretty big year for me. Scream Queen was supposed to hit theaters, actually. Um, limited release. Dreamcatcher was as well. The Dead of Night and Hunter's Moon. They all came out between March of last year and March of this year. And it's like, these were some of my big premieres. And I, there was no in-person premiere, which... Yeah. I'm, another thing that's kind of... Uh, why I, I tend to agree with Chris Nolan about this whole deal is that um, it's shorting uh, a lot of uh, like, like unions, like, um, you know, all the people that work behind the scenes, they typically can get a cut of like theatrical play, if I'm not mistaken, like uh, mm. the tag and uh, the, you know, the grips and like all like the unions there. I think they kind of, it kind of pays into like their, um, their unions, their, their pensions, their mm -hmm. retirement. And streaming services, kind of like Netflix or HBO, that they don't they don't really share their numbers and like they don't really, not necessarily that it's 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 going to be hard to kind of make that work like yeah 
me from one avenue to another. Um, and I think they're working on that. I think that was Chris Nolan's big, one of his other big things, aside from just the general cinematic experience that we all love. Mm -hmm. He'll never die. I don't think that's going to happen. But the convenience is is, hard, is tempting. <laughs> yeah, for sure. The one thing I will say, um, just because we had him on the show a couple weeks ago, uh, and while I was talking about um, how he, you know, composed and he was able to do most of the composure during the pandemic from, you know, his home. Yep. And he was able to, you know, write and, you know, he has a recording, you know, booth or studio where he was able just to put it all together um, and not have to worry about any kind of coronavirus conditions. And I know um, that, you know, you're seeing more and more production go back into full swing with, you know, obviously the safety precautions and stuff, but for you, um, you got a pretty rad guitar collection behind you, but do you, do you get to do uh, a lot of what you are composing from your house now? Uh, this is actually, uh, I live in Studio City, my uh, studio space. This is actually in, uh, I'm in Woodland Hills right now. So actually, I actually okay. my studio is separate from my home, very fortunately, because I feel like I'd probably get evicted with how loud my shit can be. Because <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I do a lot of horror. I mean, granted, I do work on cartoons and whatnot and stuff like that too, but horror is my primary. And that can be pretty taxing sonically on neighbors. Yeah, I can imagine. Luckily, my, my space is in a, a like an office building, and I also oh. have over here. You can't really see it, but I got a booth over here. I got, I'm lucky with my setup. Um, but obviously, I can't bring in session players anymore. I can't bring in voice actors. I can't bring in vocal performers. Uh, most of the stuff I do because of the budgets, it's kind of like, it's mainly me doing it. Like it's always me on guitar because that's that's what I love to do. Uh, mm -hmm. I can't play cello despite the fact that I have a cello. <laughs> I, I use it for noises essentially, but I would like to bring in like, I'd like to have a quartet sometime. I'd like to work with like, you know, session players, but we can't do that yet. Um, yeah. Unless we get tested. I actually had a didgeridoo player um, recently. Uh, we tracked him here, which was awesome. Uh, I've never tracked with a didgeridoo before. And he's uh Will Thorin. He's, um, he's like one of the world's best didgeridoo players. And I got, I, I've known him for a while. Actually, I worked for his dad at Wonder Media. It's a cartoon company. Um, and that was cool because I haven't had a chance to track with anyone in forever. So it's coming back. It's just, it's taking a while. Yeah, that, it is definitely coming back. It just, I graduated from film school in the heat of it. Hmm. And so it was like, right when, right when we're at the cusp of, the point in time where I'm like, man, like let's start looking for jobs and depending on like, are we moving to LA? What are we doing? And like the whole world shuts down. Well, congrats and, by the way for graduating. That's a big thing. Well, thank you. But, and now like just now there's starting to be like that influx of uh, like actual, like getting into the, you know, finding the spot, like, I'm starting to see those emails come through as far as like this meets your cr criteria and stuff. And I'm like, okay, so it's a, it's starting. Yeah. Like you said, to slowly get back to some kind of whatever the normalcy of a film production is going to be for, you know, a while. We actually, we made one, um, we're making one throughout this year in like three smaller chunks. And, and it was like a, uh, a thought process of a scary story all taking all taking course over uh, uh 2020 but it was like a scary story that takes place right before going in christmas of and then what will be halloween 2021 oh, so yeah. so before during and after sorry is it is it based around the pandemic the horror the horror project so in i guess like the pandemic is definitely a factor of why the characters are doing what they're doing, right? But they're not like directly affected by the pandemic necessarily. So it's like the pandemic isn't part of the story. It was just like the Christmas. So the one that's taking place, the one that we just wrapped, 
we uh, it takes place over Christmas, and we have this house that uh, like we've been really lucky in the sense where most of the film productions that we have done are like shoestring budget, and it's done with the it's done with the sense that you know we have like situations kind of bestowed upon us. So this house got represent like got brought to my attention by a family friend of ours, and he was like, "Hey." This is vacant for the foreseeable future. It's out in the middle of nowhere. Right. Like, do you want to do something with it? Like, do you want to make a film there? Oh, and okay. yeah, and it's like it has like a creepy ass basement, which in our hometown, like the house has to be like a hundred years old or more to even have a basement. So it was like a good find. And awesome. We uh, so I wrote this script that it was like coronavirus. Christmas 2020 and a bunch of friends were getting together at this remote remote house uh, that one of the friends parents was a realtor and that was so the house is vacant and he's trying to do it someplace where they're not going to get caught for having a group of over 10 and and uh, so they're in doing that there's no help when the bad guys show up directly there so it just sets it you know sets it up for that and the other two is going to be are going to be like a main character kind of going into the first i would say four months of the thing where because we all really went into it at least i know the people who surrounded me Mm -hmm. went into the thing uh looking back like very ignorant to the sense that like oh two weeks to flatten the curve yeah Uh, yeah thought like oh man i don't know if i could make it a month <laughs> yeah. I mean. first and now it's like i could do another month easy yeah so yeah we're pros at this now yeah and it's, and so that perspective and then the whole like once the world which knock on wood by halloween of this year the world pretty much will be right in pretty good shape okay. um, and uh so that's the the third story is actually centered around a haunted house, like a like a Halloween haunted house. Yeah, yeah, that sounds that sounds great. That sounds like a blast. So, I mean, that's the thing with film too. Is I don't know if you get like this, but there's always like that pre pre uh, getting to actually work uh, anxiety that goes with it. Like, oh, are you kidding me? Yeah, yeah. I can't sleep the day before shoots. Back when I used to be on set. Yeah, I'm like a zombie, but once you get into it, it's pretty easy. It's very interesting how that works. Like, yeah, it's very. I would imagine you with composing your music. Like when you get into the flow, like you got to have like a like a point where it's like you just don't want to like walk away. Oh yeah, that happens a lot. Where like I'll make plans for like dinner, and then like I'm like I'm I'm sorry, like I'm like in the zone, and luckily most of the people around me they all know. Like they know that like that's like they they give me a break. I yeah, do that as much, uh, especially now because I just miss people. And yeah. So I think like once yeah. this thing opens back up, I'm probably going to prioritize seeing human beings for like at least the first couple months, and then I'll get back to like accidentally ignoring my sister's text messages. Yeah. <laughs> I don't mean to Mackenzie and Amanda. Just <laughs> yeah. um, but yeah, man. Uh, that's one thing I, I I I do miss being on set, but um, there's no anxiety in in my studio. This is a very nice place. I'm very happy. That's kind of when I, I realized this is what I had to do. Is like I have the most fun in the studio writing music. I get more, most out of it creatively, and I just think it's like it's what I'm best at. So that's why I'm glad. Like, because uh, I I originally wanted to direct. Like I love I loved working with actors again. Mm-hmm. Chris, I, I used I acted as well. Um, so I have like a deep respect. I had a deep respect for actors when I got into directing. Now that I'm composing and I used to direct, I have a deep respect for directors. Yeah. So like I kind I know what they have to go through, and I think that's one of the, the uh, thing that kind of separates me in a sense from my contemporaries, um, other composers, is that they don't really they understand directing is complicated and they respect the director and they know how to work with them, but they don't know what they had to go through on set. Like, you know, like you're supposed to shoot outside one day and it rains, you have to fucking change everything the day of that happened. Yeah. In actually in one of the scenes. Um, I just learned about that on the last podcast that I did with uh, the director was on. 
um, Jacob. But yeah, man, it's just, I love what you guys do. Obviously, I wouldn't be able to work without you guys. So that guy, that to hear you say that is, I couldn't agree more because I, you know, the whole thing, I think that the, the best, because I came from theater background and then got into film hmm. and was doing, you know, for the longest time I was doing acting. And then as I became, more mature that's when you know the desire to actually mm -hmm. want to pursue like a an education and then and then lead towards more you know writing or directing sure. came from that but uh i definitely like i i have not had like a, a movie where i have asked anybody to uh die or do anything crazy in that sense that i haven't done it like this last one there's one of the one of the killers is a uh local pro wrestler and he has he has to choke this dude to death and it was me i was like i'm not gonna ask anybody on like he and i knew each other i'm like yeah no one else is doing it and then yeah spoiler alert hopefully no one remembers by the time that film actually comes out but like we all the the last like monster you've seen this is this like really evil circus clown and so everyone who has died over the course of it is painted up like a clown, but with just like blood smears all over them. Ooh, nice. Okay. And the other, the other two guys, I was like, I'm like, Hey, this is what we're doing. Like we're, we're, you know, get here at this time so we can do your makeup. And by the time they had gotten there, I was already clown makeup setting up the camera. And so it was like, I think that the appreciation factor of having that's a, I think that's everywhere though. Yes. Like any kind, any kind of profession, like a principal who used to be a teacher is going to appreciate a teacher a whole lot more than a principal who came from outside of education. And I think exactly like, a you know, any department uh, that you work in, you definitely have the appreciation for that because you know, the work that goes into it. Yeah. I, being a director, I think you should have kind of gone through the gauntlet, almost worked in every department. That's what I was trying to do when I first moved out here, actually, when I was pursuing directing. Was it like I kind of tried to work in like costume and like like uh, production design, uh, the, the camera department, uh, occasionally worked grip and electric. And then I kind of, because you want to kind of get like a well-rounded experience. You want to know what you're telling people to do. Uh, right. I always, I always think that most directors should have like an acting background too. It's gonna like yeah. I think that definitely helps. <laughs> you don't need a music background though. I have to I have to remember that because a lot of directors when I'm working with them, uh, they get really self conscious about the fact that they don't know like music terminology. Oh um, yeah. So it's like you don't have to do that. Like you, you just have to tell us what emotions you want to feel and kind of like really what because that's like that's why you hire us. Obviously, luckily Jacob was was like confident in like. He wasn't like self conscious. He he knew why he brought me on board because like that was my area of expertise. Um, so aside from music, maybe you should. Yeah, I don't know. What the, I'm rambling now. No, 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 no. I'm for sure. I know. I was just thinking as you were saying that. Like, yeah, I don't know if I could give. Like, if I was having a conversation with you, I, that's all I could give you is you know this kind of a dun 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 type of a thing. That's all you need. That's all um, I promise you. <laughs> but know what you mean <laughs> the the, uh, the dream catcher film in I know it is out and available for everyone to uh, get like on uh, streaming services and you should be able to find it no matter what I know as soon as I heard that it was out I immediately looked at Amazon Prime and you can definitely find it uh, over that server um, do you have anything uh that is lined up now that dream catcher is officially out and available that is coming up, you know, on deck, so to speak. Oh, I got a lot actually. <laughs> um, so there's another film I just uh, scored that came out um, last week called the dead of night uh, oh. as uh, Lance Henriksen, Matthew Lawrence, um, and uh, a, a, a fresh cast of like fresh faces. Uh, it was all shot in New Mexico. It's like this like Southwest desert horror. And I actually, just last night watched it for the first time since i scored it like a year and a half ago wow kind of like i mentioned about Dreamcatcher, like i've been able to separate myself professionally from it and mm -hmm. 
watch it as a fan and it's like this film i love this film like i i it, i it's it was um the director robert dean it's kind of like he has like the patience of like a young carpenter where a lot of things happen they play out in the wide you know it's not super flashy and the cinematography is gorgeous uh troy scouton jr shot it and it's like you want to be there you want to be in the location i love horror movies like that so it's like mm -hmm. like southwestern sort of like that vibe with two masked killers that are really unique check that out that's also available pretty much everywhere the soundtrack just came out we might be doing a vinyl which would be awesome um that would, yeah that'd be super cool um i'm doing another film uh for this really talented young director i'm going to be starting on it soon her name's uh alice mckay uh, out of australia called so vam it's like this um sort of like queer coming of age vampire story uh that's gonna be a blast because it's gonna, like the music's gonna be really just really fun the music's gonna be really kind of poppy i don't know how to explain it that's mm -hmm. kind of going uh and then a movie called time's up i don't know if you've heard about this one this has like mm -hmm. Alyssa rose uh damien maffey um from uh, strangers pray at night and haunt and uh what's the other one he just did uh the new wrong turn and elsie oh. He's in uh, uh, Your Next. He plays like the lamb killer in Your Next. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. And uh, Hannah Fearman. Um, she's um, Lily in VHS. I don't know if you've seen. Oh, Lily. yeah. Um, she's like the siren. Um, she's in this movie as well. Uh, it's called Time's Up. It's like, it takes place on New Year's. It's like a mass killer. He's dressed like Father Time. Um, and it's it's just fun, you know, and the soundtrack is going to be really cool. Yeah. Um, there's another horror movie coming out called Shot in the Dark. I don't know when it's coming out. Um, keep an eye on it, though. The, sc the score is awesome. I'll say that. I know that. That was a lot of fun. And then Butcher's Bluff. Uh, that's another film kind of like yours where they've been shooting it in chunks. Mm -hmm. uh, I should be starting that in July or August. And I have some shorts coming out like um, Witch Hunt. And I just posted a track for a... Uh, a short uh, sci-fi, really heartfelt, sort of like Spielberg-esque film called The Gazer. That's coming out next month, doing like the festival run. So there's a lot. There's a bunch going on. Yeah, man, you're busy. Yeah, and there's some cartoons that I'm doing too. Um, yeah, there. I'll I'll post more stuff about that. But yeah, I'm trying to stay as busy as I can. Where can I, where can everybody keep tabs? Uh, you can find me on Instagram, uh, Alexander Taylor Composer. Um, you can try to find me on Facebook. I'm trying not to be on there as much. Uh, my website's alexandertaylorcomposer.com. Um, but probably Instagram's probably where most of the fun stuff pops up. I'll shoot like track exclusives or like sometimes like on my stories, like stuff about like me recording will be there. Like if I'm allowed to, if like the, because like a lot of times you can't like release music or show what you're recording until the movie. Yeah, ahead of time. I'll have to get permission. But yeah, so that's that's a good way to keep up with me. Yeah. Well, right on, man. Everybody should keep tabs and uh, see all the different stuff that you got coming out. Doesn't look like you have to wait very long. He's constantly busy. Yeah. Uh, but uh, uh, Alexander, Alex, thank you, man, for uh, taking the time to uh, do the interview with us. We look forward to being able to uh, check out Dreamcatcher here soon, and we look forward to checking out all the other projects. Yeah, thank you so much, Jimmy. This was a blast. You're awesome. Thank you for having me. This is great.